Structure and inspirationally through service to the community. I want to thank Donna Blevins of Encore Players, who is unable to join us today, for putting together this fabulous show in honor of Public Works Week. I also want to thank the uh, library volunteer, Renee Lau, for helping us to host this program. Thank you, Renee. If you need a program, uh, just uh, come see Renee. Uh, do I hear a phone ringing? Okay. All right. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, uh, finally, I want to thank Encore players, especially uh, all my fellow presenters here today for, for presenting to you all uh, and for inviting me to be a part of the program as uh, one of the guest speakers. All right, so now, please put your uh, mobile devices on silent or vibrate. Our show is about to begin. And to kick off the program, put your hands together for Bob Cowgill. Good afternoon. As Paul said, my name is Bob Cavill. I'm the president of Encore Players at Livermore. We're thrilled to be here today uh, sharing a series of play excerpts, a short readings, and talks pertaining to public works. Some directly so, others with a comical bent to them. Uh, we hope you enjoy the next hour with us. And now we begin the show. Here in Town, the musical is a musical comedy that premiered in 2001 and satirizes the legal system, capitalism, social irresponsibility, populism, bureaucracy, corporate mismanagement, and municipal politics. A 20-year drought has caused a terrible water shortage, causing private toilets to be a thing of the past. And the public toilets are controlled by a mega corporation. What could go wrong? The control, to control water consumption, people have to pay to use these facilities. There are harsh laws concerning these activities, and offenders are sent to a place called Urine Town. <laughs> Never to return. Well, hello there, and welcome to Urine Town. Uh, not the place, it's the, a musical. <laughs> You're in town, the place as well. Um, uh, it's a place you'll hear of people referring to a lot throughout the night, this show. You hear the news? They caught it old so and so off to your in town the other day. Is that so? What do you do? Oh, well, such and such I hear. Well, what do you know, oh, so and so? It's kind of a mythical place. You understand? A, a bad place. A, a place. We won't see until Act Two, and then, well, uh, let's just say it's filled with symbolisms and things like that. This here's the first setting for the show. As the sign says, it's a public amenity, a meaning public toilet. Ooh. These people have been waiting for hours to get in. It's the only amenity they can afford uh, to get into. Say, Officer Lockstock, is this where you tell the audience about the water shortage? Uh, what's that, little sound? You know, the water shortage, the hard times, the drought. A shortage so awful that private toilets are eventually became unthinkable. 
A premise so absurd uh, that... Whoa, uh, little Sally, not all at once. They'll hear more about the water shortage in the next scene. Oh, I guess you don't want to overload them with too much exposition, huh? Uh, everything in its time, little Sally. You're too young to understand now, but nothing can kill a show like too much exposition. How about a bad subject matter? Uh, well... Or a bad title, even. That could kill a show pretty good. Well, suffice it is to say, in You're in Town, the musical, everyone has to use public bathrooms in order to take care of their uh, private business. And that's the central conceit of the show. It's a privilege to pee. Water's worth its weight in gold these days. No more bathrooms like the olden days. You come here and pay a fee for the privilege to pee. <laughs> Later on, you'll learn these public bathrooms are controlled by a private company. They keep admission high, uh, generally so if you're down on your luck, you have to come to, this pl to a place like this, one of the poorest, filthiest urinals in town. And you can't go in the bushes by uh, either. The law's against it. That's right. Harsh laws, too. That's why little Sally here's counting her pennies. Isn't that so, little Sally? I'm very close, officer. Only a few pennies away. Aren't we all, little Sally? Aren't we all? Twenty years we've had in drought, and our reservoirs have all dried up. I take my bath now in a coffee cup. I boil what's left for it for tea. Oh, and it's a privilege to pee. The politicians in their wisdom saw that there should be a law. The politicians taxed the toilets and made illegal public urination and dedication. Say, Officer Lockstock, I was thinking, we don't spend too much time on hydraulics, do we? Hydraulics? You know, hydraulics. Hydration, irrigation, or, or just plain old laundry. Seems to me that with all the talk about water shortage and drought and whatnot, we might spend some time on those things, too. After all, a dry spell would affect hydraulics, too, you know. Oh, why, sure it would, but, um, um... How shall I put it? Um, sometimes in a, in a musical, it's better to focus on one big thing rather than a lot of little things. The audience tends to uh, be much happier that way, and it's, it's easier to write. One big thing, huh? That's right, little Sally. Oh. Well, why not hydraulics? Uh, run along then, little Sally. Wouldn't want you to miss last call. Oh, yeah, right. I almost have enough. Oh, 496, 497, just a few more. So come and give your coins to me. Write your name here in the record book. The authorities will, will want to look if you've been regular with me, if you have paid the proper fee for the privilege to pee. <laughs> <laughs> Now, Marsha will give us uh, some information about the Working <coughs> Program Administration, or WPA, of 1935, and some very interesting information. You might be wondering how theater fits into a program about public works. When you think about public works, I'll bet you think about bridges, and roads, and parks, and airports. Bet you don't think it could include theater. In 1932, when Franklin D. Roosevelt was accepting the Democratic nomination for president, he said, I pledge you, I pledge myself, to a new deal for the American people. The first new deal from 33 to 34 had a lot of great stuff, but the second new deal focused on the workers. Among the programs was the Works Progress Administration, WPA which employed millions of Americans to public works projects, including the arts. There was a part of the WTA PA called the Federal Theater Project. It was headed by an amazing woman who was an American theatrical producer, director, playwright, and author. Her name was Hallie Flanagan Davis, but professionally she went by Hallie Flanagan. 
She directed the WPA's Federal Theater Project from 35 to 39. In this role, she oversaw the hiring of thousands of unemployed theater workers and the production of nearly 64,000 theatrical performances for over 30 million audience members. Shortly after the FTP was terminated, Flanagan said, we know now what many doubted four, four years ago, that great numbers of people, millions of them, who had never gone to the theater or who had stopped going, want to go to the theater if the plays are good and admission is reasonable. In the four years it existed, it helped many people, people like Orson Welles, Arthur Miller, Eli Kazan, John Houseman. She died in 1969. Writing in the New York Times, at the time of her death, the eminent actor and director, John Houseman, recalled Halley and what he said was the assassination of the FTP. He said, those of us in the theater will remember her for those three fantastic years in which she and her collaborators turned a pathetic relief project into what remains the most creative and dynamic approach that has yet been made to an American national <laughs> The New Deal restored a sense of security as it created the framework that could protect in the interests of all Americans, rich and poor. In his inaugural address on March 4, 1933, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt said, our greatest primary task is to put people to work. This is no unsolvable problem if we face it wisely and courageously. But it was Eleanor Roosevelt that was called the eyes and the ears of the New Deal. Now here's Victoria to tell us more about Eleanor's accomplishments. As First Lady, Eleanor Roosevelt was an outspoken activist for the rights and the needs of the poor, of the minority, and of the disadvantaged. She traveled across the country to meet people visited relief projects, surveying working and living conditions, and then reporting back their observations to the president. She promoted projects in the Appalachian and worked with the help and worked to help black miners in West Virginia. She worked closely to the early civil rights leaders and advanced the rights to African and Asian Americans and of the World War II refugees. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, the impact of her personality and its unrevealing devotion to high principles and purposes cannot be obtained in any single day or year. She advocated for expanded roles for women in the workplace and worked with the Women's Trade Union League in support of 48-hour work week, minimum wage, and the abolish of child labor. She supported increased roles for women in the war effort and began to advocate for women to be given factory jobs and the year before it became a widespread practice. In 1942, she urged women of all social backgrounds to learn the trade, saying, if I were a debutante age, I would go into the factory, any factory where I could learn the skill and be useful. Especially concerned with younger Americans, Eleanor wrote, I have moments of real terror. I think we might be losing this generation. We have got to bring these young people into the active life of community and make them feel that they are necessary. Paul will now give some eye-opening information about the industrialist and philanthropist, I get his name wrong every time, Andrew Carnegie. <laughs> To some, Andrew Carnegie represents the American dream. He was an immigrant from Scotland who at age 18 was employed as a telegraph operator at a salary of $4 per week by the Pennsylvania Railroad, which would be vital to his later success. The railroads were the first big businesses in America. Carnegie is not only known as an industrialist, but also for philanthropic works. He was a large benefactor of the Tuskegee Institute 
for African American education under Booker T. Washington and helped create the National Negro Business League. Carnegie was not without controversy. In 1875, his steel industry transformed America from an agricultural society into an industrial one. And he stated his approval for trade unions. He expressed empathy to striking workers, saying, to expect that one dependent upon his daily wage for, his ne for the necessities of life will stand peaceably by is to expect much. The Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers named the division in Carnegie's honor and anointed him as an honorary member. However, Carnegie did not want unions in his steel mills. He demanded that laborers return to 12-hour shifts and be paid on a sliding scale that tied their wages directly to the price of steel. Workers walked off the job in protest until they were forced to give in to company demands after five months without a paycheck. The Carnegie Steel Company continued to crack down on organized labor. When 40 men were found trying to revive the union in 1899, all were fired. Not until the 1930s, with the protection of New Deal legislation, did unions return to the steel industry. In 1901, he sold the Carnegie Steel Company to banker J.P. Morgan for $480 million and became the richest man in the world. Before his death in 1919, Carnegie gave more than $350 million in philanthropic works, including the establishment of more than 2,500 public libraries around the world. He is quoted as saying, I have known millionaires starving for a lack of the nutriment which can sustain all that is human in man. And I know workmen and many so-called poor men who revel in luxuries beyond the power of those millionaires. It is the mind that makes the body rich. Combining Railroads and Libraries. Judy will read The Little Engine That Could, which is celebrating its 90th anniversary. It has been reimagined by Dan Santa, winner of the Caldecott Medal for Distinguished Children's Picture Books. Santa, born to Thai immigrants, lives in Southern California with his wife, sons, and assorted pets. He writes, I think I can. It doesn't take much to lift a person's spirits and make us believe that we can all become more than we ever dreamed. Here is a quote from another person you will recognize. 25 years ago, I decided to offer a free book gifting program to the children in my hometown in Tennessee. It only took a minute to choose the little engine that could. This is more than just a book in a child's hands. It is an expression of our love to unite the aspirations of children to be whomever they want to be. So thank you, little engine, for inspiring us for 90 years May you keep chugging along to take all of us to the other side of the mountain. Love, Dolly Parton. That could. Chug, chug, 
chug, puff, puff, puff. Ding dong, ding dong, the little train rumbled over the trucks. She was a happy little train, for she had such a jolly load to carry. Her cars were filled with full good things for the boys and girls. They were toy animals, giraffes, long necks, teddy bears, with almost no necks at all, and even a baby elephant. Then there were dolls, dolls with blue eyes and yellow curls, dolls with brown eyes, brown mop heads, <coughs> and the funniest little toy clown you ever saw. And they were cars full of toy engines, <coughs> airplanes, tops, jackknives, picture puzzle books, and every kind of things boys or girls could want. But that was not all. Some of the cars were filled with all sorts of good things for boys and girls to eat. Big golden oranges, red check apples, bottles of creamy milk for their breakfast, fresh spinach for their dinners, peppermint drops, and lollipops for after their meal treats. <laughs> The little train was carrying all these wonderful things to the good little boys and girls on the other side of the mountain. She puffed along merrily, then all of a sudden she stopped with a jerk. She simply could not go another inch. She tried and she tried, but her wheels would not turn. What were all those good little boys and girls on the other side of the mountain going to do without their wonderful toys to play with and the good food to eat. Here comes a shiny new engine, said the funny little clown who jumped out of the train. Let us ask him to help us. So all the dolls and the toys cried out together, please shiny new engine, won't you please pull out our train over the mountain? Our engine has broken down, and the boys and the girls on the other side won't have any toys to play with or good food to eat unless you help us. But the shiny new engine snorted. I pull you. I'm a passenger engine. I have just carried to find big train over the mountains with more cars than you ever dreamed of. My train has sleeping cars with comfortable berths, a dining car, where waiters bring whatever hungry people want to eat, and parlor cars in which people sit in soft armchairs and look out of the big plate glass. Windows, I pull the likes of you, indeed not. And off he streamed to the roadhouse, where Engines live where they are not busy. How sad the little train and all the dolls and the toys felt. Then the little clown called out, the passenger engine is not the only one in the world. Here's another engine coming, a great big strong one. Let us ask him to help us. The little toy clown waved his flag and the big strong engine came to a stop. Please, oh please, big engines, cried all the dolls and toys together. Won't you please pull out our train over the mountain? Our engine has broken down and the good little boys and girls on the other side won't have any toys to play with or good food to eat unless you help us. But the big strong engine bellowed, I'm a freight train. I have just pulled a big train loaded with big machines over the mountain. These machines print books and newspapers for grown-ups to read. I am a very important engine. Indeed, I will pull the likes of you and the freight engine pulled off indignantly to the roundhouse. The little train and all the books and toys were very sad. Cheer up, cried the little toy clown. The freight engine is not only one in the world. Here comes another. He looks very old and 
tired, but our train is so little, perhaps he can help us. So the little toy clown waved his flag, and the dingy, rusty old engine stopped. Please, kind engine, cried all the dolls and toys together, won't you please pull our train over the mountain? Our engine is broken down, and the boys and the girls on the other side won't have any toys to play with or good food to eat, and miss you help us. But the rusty old engine sighed, I'm so tired. I must rest my weary wheels. I cannot pull even such a little train as yours over the mountain. I cannot. I cannot. I cannot. And off he rumbled to the roundhouse, chugging, I cannot. I cannot. <laughs> And indeed, the little train, very, very sad, and the dolls and the toys were ready to cry. But the little clown called out, Here's another engine coming, a little blue engine, a very little one. Maybe she will help us. The very little engine came chug chugging merrily along. When she saw the toy clown's flag, she stopped quickly. What is the matter, my friend? She asked kindly. Oh, little blue engine, cried the dolls of toys. Will you pull us over the mountain? Our engine has broken down, and the good boys and girls on the other side won't have any toys to play with or good food to eat. Unless you help us, please, please help us, the little blue engine. I'm not very big. And the little blue, said the little blue engine, they use me only for switching trains in the yard. I have never been over the mountain. But we must get over the mountain before the children awake, said all the dolls and toys. The very little engine up and saw the tears in the doll's eyes. And she thought of the good little boys and girls on the other side of the mountain would not have any toys or good food unless she helped. Then she said, I think I can. I think I can. I think I can. And she hitched herself to the little train. She tugged and pulled and tugged and slowly, slowly she started off. The toy clown jumped aboard and all the dolls of the toy animals began to smile and cheer. Puff, puff, chug, chug. But the little blue engine, I think I can, 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 I think I can. Up, up, faster and faster and faster the little engine climbed until at last they reached the top of the mountain. Down in the valley lay the city. Hurry, hurry, cried the funny little clown and all the do dolls and toys. The good little boys and girls in the city will be happy because you helped us, kind little blue engine. And the little blue engine smiled and seemed to say as she puffed steadily down the mountain, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could, I thought I could. And that's the end. <laughs> <laughs> that's On June 29, 1956, President Dwight Eisenhower signed into law the Federal Highway Act of 1956. This will become the largest public works project in the nation's history. Eisenhower stated, our unity as a nation is sustained by free communication of thought and by easy transportation of people and goods. Greer will now give us a view from those very highways. In 1960, John Steinbeck, in declining health, wanted to see this country one more time and went on a 10,000-mile journey. 
He equipped a camper with everything he would need. Bourbon, scotch, gin, vodka, brandy, beer, and his great French poodle, Charlie. And set off in search of America. He wrote in his journal, there are times that one treasures for all one's life. I felt very fortunate the day Charlie and I started our journey. I am not a map person. I was born lost and take no pleasure in being found. From the beginning, I tried to avoid superhighways. I found myself on US 90, where the minimum speed was greater than anything I had ever driven. Instructions screamed at me from the road. Do not stop. No stopping. Maintain speed. These great roads are wonderful for moving goods, but not for the inspection of the countryside. We do these, when we do get these throughways across the whole country done, as we will and must, it will be possible to drive from New York to California without seeing a thing. <laughs> My good friend, Phil Mumford. Phil is a very adventuresome soul. He has traversed the continent of the United States twice. Once the rumor has it, he won't confirm, but he did it for donations to Sonoma in school. He also drives, like my friend Judy in the audience, the bus up Kilcar Road. Now that to me is a mean feat on a very small U.S. highway. Here's Phil to tell us his adventures riding his 10 speed across the United States. Phil? Good. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> so, uh, so, uh, so 1977, uh, first time I went across uh, with a friend. Uh, and we, uh, our route was uh, basically to go from Newport, Oregon to Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, those were the only plans we made. And uh, <laughs> once we uh, started out, then we just, every time we come to a state, then you uh, pick up a road map. Back in those days, you'd get them at a gas station, and we could kind of figure out which way we want to go from there. Uh, the equipment wasn't uh, very fancy, just a 10-speed bike. You can hardly even buy a 10-speed anymore. Uh, and uh, I had homemade panniers from a Frostland kit, no bicycle computer like they have today, every bike has it now. And uh, the only thing I have left from that particular journey is, uh, well, I did have a helmet, the, uh, the original bike helmet they used to, to have. And, uh, oh, yeah, and the seat. This is a uh, <laughs> old brick uh, small. Uh, I can't even believe it myself. <laughs> uh, see, uh, oh yeah, um, no, no riding gear, no spandex, no, you know, no, what they have these days for, to get on a bike. Just gym shorts, cutoffs, t-shirts, and then for warmth, sweatpants, sweatshirt, jacket. Uh, ponchos for rain, which weren't very efficient when you're bicycling, which are blowing around. And just old tennis shoes, just Adidas tennis shoes that I had. The uh, tent was like a $15 blue and orange tent from Thrifty Drugstore. We used to sell these tents, these little blue and white pup tents, uh, which did remarkably well, I have to admit, in big rainstorms. Then I had a uh, Svea uh, camp stove, which I don't have anymore, but I have something similar, about the same size. And uh, then we. Uh, I think this might even be the original pot we used. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, let's see. Uh, and I have the, the route. So, American is the moment. We'll try to do some memory here. Oh, my God. oh yeah. So, uh, leaving from Oregon, of course, and uh, just <coughs> playing it east, and just started going over. Uh, 
McKinsey Pass to get over the, uh, the, uh, the mountain range there, and then uh, on into Boise, Idaho. From Boise, we found our way to Yellowstone National Park, spent uh, about a four or five days in Yellowstone. They have like a six figure eight route, road around there, so we spent some time in Yellowstone, and then uh, left the Rockies over in Togarty Pass down the Wind River, uh, straight across Wyoming into Casper, then headed south to, uh, uh, where'd we go? Oh, let's see. Uh, oh, I got some notes here. I should read them. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh, yeah, so we went through Medicine Bowl and Laramie, and then we got into Fort Collins, Colorado, and then we headed east again across Colorado till we got to uh, Ogallala and Nebraska, which is where we picked up the Platte River, which was kind of a highway <coughs> for coming west uh, for Pony Express. I don't know, Mormon Trail, I'm not sure who came across it, but that was kind of a, their route, and we were kind of going in the reverse direction. Um, so we followed the Platte through Nebraska, and then down into Kansas, and then headed east through Kansas into uh, Kansas City, Kansas City, Missouri, then across Missouri, pretty straight line to uh, St. Louis. And then once we get left St. Louis, we were into uh, Illinois, and that's where we picked up the Lincoln Highway, uh, Highway 50, um, and that took us quite a ways. And um, so southern, uh, southern Illinois, southern uh, Indiana, and then Ohio. And uh, Indiana, we entered in Vincennes, Indiana, which is the uh, birthplace of Red Skelton. And the idea is on a bicycle, you can read every single historical landmark that you come across because you're only going five miles an hour anyway. <laughs> it doesn't have to stop. So that was a big advantage for us. Um, after we left Ohio, we got into Parkersburg, uh, West Virginia, then followed the Ohio up a little ways to like Moundsville or someplace up there, and uh, crossed into uh, Pennsylvania and uh, Monongahela, and then basically straight across Pennsylvania uh, through Harrisburg, Gettysburg, and then once we got uh, close to Philadelphia, uh, Philadelphia, we headed north, and then into um, New Jersey, through Patterson, New Jersey, and finally to Nyack, New York, and we were going to, we were going to cross the um, Tappan Zee Bridge, but there was a problem because you can't ride your bike across the Tappan Zee Bridge. So didn't say on the map, it looked okay <laughs> for, for us. So we had to go uh, up the Hudson River about 15 miles to find another bridge to go across. Uh, into Peaksville, a little bit into New York, and then down into Connecticut. Uh, and they followed the coast of Connecticut uh, up into Rhode Island. That's where my friend was from. And so um, that was the end of our trip in, the, in Rhode Island. Uh, in the whole trip, we never stayed in a motel, never ate in a restaurant. And uh, uh, I think I, I figured it was about $4.50 a day, including my airfare back to do that whole trip in 1977. Tell them what you collected. Huh? Tell them what you collected. What you collected off the ground. Your oh, uh, you mean like roadkill for dinner? And <laughs> <laughs> Definitely that. Yeah. Oh. And how you cooked them too. So, no, uh, not too much roadkill unless we found some produce. We did most of our shopping in the grocery stores in the produce section. No, no prepared food, no canned food, maybe tuna, a lot of rice and that type, that type of thing. Oatmeal in the morning and a lot of fruit and vegetables. But uh, actually what we found in the morning was uh, pennies. We, <laughs> if you find a lucky penny, we stopped for a penny just because it brought you luck during the day. And during the day, you'll find out uh, where that luck came, came, you know, it shows up. <laughs> Something will happen if it, a lucky penny. Uh, yeah, so we uh, plan to stay in the state parks because they used to have the 50 cent hiker biker area in the state park. Uh, but today, you run out of state parks as soon as you leave the coast. So uh, we basically ended up staying in people's yards. And uh, at first they offered, we would ask them if any place to camp near here, and they let us stay in their yards. And then um, if they didn't ask them, we just started knocking on doors. So around two or three in the afternoon, We'd not, you know, if we find a place that looked reasonable, we'd knock on the doors, ask if they, we could stay. And 
my friend Georgina, her job was to look pathetic at the road, so, <laughs> so it never got turned down. Uh, as it turned out, let's see. Yeah, so the bottom line is it ended up being close to 4,000 uh, 4, miles, 80 days, and so about 50 miles a day. And then once it got there, I just I flew home, and that was the end of the trip. Wow. <laughs> I don't even like riding to the grocery store. <laughs> Unions have steadfast advocated for worker rights, workplace safety, and effective legislation for betterment of all workers. The 1979 film, Normal Ray, starring Sally Fields and Rod Liebman, was based on a true account. Now here is Joyce to talk more about Normal Ray. In 1973, the New York Times ran a profile on Crystal Lee Jordan, a mill worker from North Carolina who joined the Textile Workers Union of America. Sally Field portrayed Crystal, a single mother with two children, as iron-willed and outspoken as she rebels against the company's harsh policies, labor policies. The drowning sounds in the factory where you can hardly hear yourself highlights the worker's plight. She is fighting for class solidarity. But when her employer excuse me, threatens to fire her, she responds, I'm staying right where I am. It's going to take you, the fire department, the police department, and the National Guard to get me out of here. When Ruben Orchowski, a union organizer from New York, shows up, the overworked and underpaid workers at the cotton mill join the fight. Crystal Lee Jordan really did stand on a table, sign in hand, as Sally Field did, who portrayed her. Standing with a union sign as the machines go silent is as iconic a cinematic moment as any. <clears throat> and now, here is Bill as a union organizer who inspired Norma Ray. The character of Ruben Warshawski in the film Norma Ray was based on the real Eli Zizkovich, a former West Virginia coal miner and union organizer. This is Ruben's speech to the textile workers. <clears throat> On October 8, 1970, my grandfather Isaac Abraham Orshofsky, age 87, died in New York City. On the following Friday, the funeral was held. My mother and father attended, my two uncles from Brooklyn attended, my Aunt Minnie came up from Florida. Also present were 862 members of the Amalgamated Clothing Workers and Cloth Hat and Hat Makers Union of America who were also members of his family. And that was in life, they stood at his side. They had fought battles with him, bound the wounds of battles with them, had earned bread together and broken bread together. When they spoke, they spoke as one voice. And they were heard. They were black, and they were white. And they were Irish, they were Polish. They were Catholic, they were Jews. They were one. That's what a union is, one. Ladies and gentlemen, the textile industry in which you are spending your lives and your substance is the only industry in the whole length and breadth of these United States of America that is not unionized. Therefore, they are free to exploit you, to lie to you, to cheat you, to take away from you what is rightfully yours, your health, a decent wage, a fit place to work. I would urge you to stop them by signing a union card. It says in the Bible, yes, it comes from the Bible, according to the tribes of your fathers, ye shall inherit. It also comes from Ruben Warshawski, but not unless you make it happen. Thank you. The International Labor Organization was formed in 1919 as part of the Treaty of Versailles that ended World War I. Public Works was linked uh, 
was Lincoln's recognition that only real solution for unemployment is employment. Uh, to this day, is devoted to advancing opportunities for women and men to obtain decent, productive work in conditions of freedom, equity, security, and human dignity, ensuring that women can participate and contribute to the planning and implementation of rural infrastructure was and is a major priority. And now, I present Ellie. My name is Marva. I live in Cebu City, Philippines with my husband and one-year-old son. When I was in college, my father lost his job and my mother became a fish vendor to support our family and I worked as a domestic for three years, convinced that education would be the best foundation for my future. As a woman in the construction industry, I've had to deal with verbal criticism and discrimination from those who think I'm not fit for the job. People would question why I was a construction worker. I was told I should go home and find a husband to take care of me. I wanted to be a chemical engineer, but the only course at our local university was in secondary education, so I completed a degree in that. Then a friend told me about a recruitment program. At, at age 21, I was among the 17 women who were chosen to be trained as pioneers in the construction industry. I thought I would work in a factory and operate small machines. Instead, I was trained on heavy equipment, like backhoe loaders, hydraulic excavators, and bulldozers. I was hired as a regular employee, but to gain respect in a male-dominated industry, I have had to constantly prove myself, my worth, and my skills. Once while operating an excavator, I accidentally cut the power supply of the entire room. <laughs> Another time, I almost tipped over the equipment onto a stockpile of hazardous waste. My mistakes and challenges became a foundation to grow my career. I became a stronger, better version of myself. I took more training, such as welding, carpentry, painting, and scaffold assembly, and completed a civil engineering degree. Now as a supervisor, I am leading seven teams with over 250 workers and trainees in the International Labor Organization. My advice is that every day is an opportunity to learn. The only constant in the world is change itself. If you do not engage in lifelong learning, you will be left behind. You must compete with yourself from the old you to the new you. Strike while the iron, iron rod is hot is a saying, but it's true. When an iron rod reaches its melting point, a blacksmith can shape it into whatever he wants it to be. Focus on your goal. Do not mind your critics. Open yourself up to learning and have the will to succeed. The National Park Service, founded in 1916, was faithfully created for our natural, historical, and cultural treasures. Visitors to national parks contribute billions to regional economies while creating hundreds of thousands of private sector jobs. In turn, the labor income from these jobs spurred more economic growth in nearby communities. Guerrero will now share a little about Rosie the Riveter. Rosie the Riveter is featured in the National Historic Park in Richmond, California. She is an iconic image and symbol representing the American women who worked in factories and shipyards during World War II. The World Wars were total wars, which required governments to utilize their entire populations to defeat their enemies. Making male workers joined the military, and millions of women were encouraged to work in the defense industry. Women responded to the call by stepping up to fill positions that were traditionally held by men. They worked with heavy construction machinery, taking rolls and lumber and steel mills, as well as uploading freight, building dirigibles, and making munitions. <laughs> Sorry, I lost it. Women with their children at home pooled together in their efforts to raise their families. They assembled into groups and shared such chores as cooking and cleaning and washing clothes. The women felt accomplished and proud of their work. Over six 
million women got war jobs. African American, Hispanic, white, and Asian women worked side by side. Their motto was, we can do it. Now Leo will tell us about a very famous park ranger from the Rosita River Museum. And if you ever get a chance, go up there, it really is interesting. Betty Reed Soskin, born September 22, 1921, is a retired ranger with the National Park Service, previously assigned to the Rosie the Riveter World War II Homefront National Historical Park in Richmond. Until her retirement in 2022, at the age of 100, she was the oldest National Park Ranger serving the United States. Her memoir, Sign My Name to Freedom, was released in February 2018. Betty grew up in a Cajun Creole African American family that settled in Oakland after the Great Flood devastated New Orleans in 1927. She can recall ferry boats crossing the San Francisco Bay prior to the bridges that now span it. And she remembers when the Oakland International Airport consisted of two small hangars. <laughs> in the early 2000s, Betty participated in meetings with the City of Richmond and the National Park Service to develop uh, the general management plan for Rosie the Riveter Park. She worked with a grant funded by PG&E to uncover stories of African Americans during World War II and led public programs sharing her personal remembrances and observations. In 2015, she was selected to introduce President Obama at the National Tree Lighting Ceremony at the White House for a telecast on PBS. She later attended the grand opening ceremony of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture as Interior Secretary Sally Jewell's guest. Among her many accomplishments are, she was named Woman of the Year by the California State Legislature. She is listed as one of 10 Outstanding Builders of Communities of Dreams by the National Women's History Project. Betty received the Silver Medallion Award at the World War II Museum in New Orleans. There are only two women among 30 recipients. The other is Elizabeth Dole. The Sierra Club gave their prestigious Trailblazer Award for a lifetime of service and barrier breaking. At the age of 93, Betty reflected, Wish I'd had the confidence when the young Betty needed it to navigate through the hazards of everyday life on the planet. But maybe I'm better able to navigate, to benefit from having it now. When I have the maturity to value it and the audacity to wield it for those things held dear, we can only do what we are able to do at any given time and under a single set of circumstances, and we must not feel unsuccessful in any one attempt. Four months, that's all. Four months. Not very strong. But like the little engine that could, with <laughs> perseverance. <laughs> so here to tell us about the now world famous little light bulb that can, the city historian Richard Finn. <laughs> You know, when I wrote this, I wrote the first thing I hear it says, the story of a little light that could. <laughs> so it fits right in. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. What's 122 years old and has been in service for almost 1.1 million hours? A little light. A little light. A little light. And it's still going strong. The answer, of course, is the little light that's at uh, Firehouse Number 6 on uh, East Avenue. In 1901, Dennis Burnell, who I will talk a little bit about him later, because he's a very interesting person, he donated uh, items from the Livermore Power and Light Company. Uh, which he had just sold. And one of the items he donated was a Shelby light bulb. And the bulb we know 
was first installed at the firehouse uh, cart, well, the cart house, which was on L Street. And then, very shortly after, it was moved to Second Street to the big firehouse, uh, which is, or which was, where the um, Wells Fargo parking lot is now. That's where the firehouse was for this. In 1906, the bulb was moved again, this time to the brand new firehouse near the corner of First and McLeod Streets. The bulb originally was left on 24 hours a day so that the volunteers, there were no paid folks in those days, so that the volunteers when they came in wouldn't trip over things. <laughs> and that bulb stayed in that firehouse then for 70 years until 1976 when it was moved with a police and fire escort to the new firehouse on uh, firehouse or fire station number six on East Avenue where it can be uh, seen uh, happy and alive today. <laughs> The bulb uh, has shined continuously now the 122 years, except when it was moved. And for about a week in 1937, when the WPA uh, modernized the firehouse. You know, in the old days, the firehouse on McLeod and, and First was brick. And they said, well, that looks so old fashioned. And so it was stucco then, and a lot of other work done in 1937. So about a week, uh, we think it was out of service. And then in 19, excuse me, in 2013, it was out of service for about nine and a half hours when the PG&E service went off and the backup system failed. And as you can guess, there have been a number of people who doubted that the bulb was really that old, and if so, how um, it, it could have lasted for a million hours when the average incandescent bulb lasts for about a thousand hours. A halogen bulb lasts for about 2,000 hours, and the new LED bulbs last from 10 to maybe up to 50,000 hours. It is thought that the Livermore Shelby bulb started life at around 30, and some say 60 watts. We don't know for sure, but uh, that's what Shelby made, 30 watt bulbs, 60 watt bulbs. After the uh, 2013 power outage, it spiked up to about 60 watts for a short time and then it dropped down to four watts, uh, which it was before, and which it now is, around four watts. The amazing long life is even more remarkable when you find out that in the old days, when the firemen left the firehouse, they all swatted the ball. <laughs> every fireman going to every fire swatted the ball. This was supposed to give good luck. <laughs> now scientists at the U.S. Naval Academy's Annapolis Physics Lab have examined uh, Shelby bulb very, very nearly the same as the one that we have. And they found the uh, filament thickness to be point a 0 0.08 millimeters and the same uh, which is the same as ours now some people thought that our bulb lasted so long because the filament filament was much thicker but uh, no ours is the same um, 0 0.08 oh and for reference a human hair is 0 0.06 to 0 0.09. So the filament is about the same thickness <laughs> as the hair. Okay, scientists from Sandia National Labs have also conducted research on a Shelby bulb made, made in the early 1900s 
and found the filament was indeed uh, carbon, but had some small flecks of silica on the surface. And it was never uh, plated. Some people thought it was plated with something, and that's why it lasted longer. But uh, San Diego scientists uh, determined that it uh, was not uh, plated at all. And they found it was the same thickness as everybody else who's tried to measure it at uh, 0.08 inches. Okay, our light bulb is very famous. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, very famous. It's in the uh, Guinness Book of World Records and has been named the oldest known working light bulb in the world. Ripley's, believe it or not, has done the same and it's been featured nationally on ABC, NBC, CBS, PBS, Fox, the Travel Channel, CNN. It also has been on uh, TV in Germany, uh, France, and Australia. It has been featured in newspapers and magazines all over the world, and as well as in uh, Bay Area TV and uh, uh, stations and newspapers. There's been a couple children's books uh, written about it, and a, uh, a, a short uh, movie, and those are available at the Heritage uh, uh, Guild, which is in the Carnegie Building, <laughs> the old Carnegie Library on 3rd Street. And then the retired uh, Deputy Fire Chief uh, uh, Thomas uh, Brommel wrote a, a, a fact-filled book about the bulb entitled A Million Hours of Service. And uh, Bill, if you want to hold that up, so it's a, if you're really interested in detail, it's, it's in that book. And also Ann Holman and her uh, amazing book about Livermore history, um, Livermore A to Z, that she has quite a section in there. And she's written newspaper articles about it, too. OK, the, I, I have to tell you, the light bulb is really a party animal. Uh, it had a big party with a barbecue in 2001. And old fire trucks, old cars, came from all over Northern California. More than 600 people attended that event. Uh, we even sang a happy birthday to the ball. <laughs> uh, after a lot of speeches and uh, presentations, including from the White House. In June of 2011, there was another big party with cake, ice cream, live music, and a balloon drop. And the uh, movie called Century of Light uh, was previewed at that time. And that's also available at the uh, Carnegie Building. In June 2015, there was yet another big party when the bulb turned over a million hours of service. Over 500 people had attended that party, many dressed in period costumes. Again, after a lot of speeches, uh, cake and ice cream, we sang happy birthday again. <laughs> a party was planned for uh, 2021, but of course because of COVID, that was called off. So it looks like the next big party will be 2026, uh, when it'll be 125 years old. Now a little bit about Dennis Burnell. Dennis Burnell to me is an amazing person. Uh, direct descendant of the Spaniards that, that came to California. Most of them lost everything when the gold rush happened uh, for all kind of reasons. They, they lost their property and uh, uh, many, like Amador, who was one of the richest people in all of California, owned about half this valley. Counties are named after him, Amador County. Uh, schools, roads, whatever, um, died absolutely bankrupt in San Jose. Now, Dennis um, Philbert Burnell is a completely opposite story. He was born in Pleasanton in 1856. His parents and grandparents were born in California. His great-grandparents came from Mexico in 1776 as part of the uh, De Anza uh, expedition. After he graduated from Hills B 
Business College, 1879. He bought 205 acres from Robert Livermore, uh, part of uh, Rancho Las Positas. He inherited 541 acres uh, from his father, uh, which was part of Rancho El Valle de San Jose. Bernal then became a rancher, a farmer, a real estate developer, a merchant, the owner of the uh, city Power Lake Water Company, and the owner, and maybe more important than anything else, he was the owner of the Livermore Brewery. <laughs> which they claim, they claim to uh, have the purest beer in the entire United States. Burnell was also at times a volunteer fireman. He was a town marshal, town tre treasurer, and an interpreter for the courts. His uh, native language was Spanish. Burnell died in uh, uh, 1932. Well, I might say that his home it still exists at uh, 755 South L Street. And it's in really, really great shape. You drive by there, it's very impressive. And it's one of the few houses in town that still have a barn in the back. You can look, and the barn is still there. And uh, he was buried at the Chapel of Chimes in uh, Oakland. The public is invited to see the light bulb uh, between the hours of 10 and 11.30 a.m. and 3 and to 5 p.m. seven days a week. Uh, you might want to call ahead, and I have the phone number if you're interested. But uh, if you go, I always park in the back. I don't know if you're supposed to. But parking on East Down is not such a good idea. Um, you can park in the back, or you could park at the rec center, uh, community center, and uh, walk over. And uh, knock on the door, and. Uh, Tell them you'd like to see the light bulb. <laughs> okay, so with that, live on with the light bulb. Yeah. Well, we'd like to thank you all this afternoon and ask if there's any brief questions for any, uh, any of our marvelous uh, presenters this afternoon. Any questions for you before we go? Did you have a question? Actually, yes, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> is, the, is the webcam still operating? The webcam uh, failed, oh, but they have a brand new one. It <laughs> apparently works quite well. They don't have the longest running webcam out there. No. <laughs> <laughs> the light bulb's a lot the webcam. Is there any other question? I have a question. Yeah. So this program you see here is uh, put together by Encore players, and, and they all uh, compose of volunteers, and, uh, and, and they go out into the community and they produce uh, shows like this, like in the library uh, and, and other shows. So my question is, how can people follow Encore players, and how can they support Encore players? Two things. We have a website. Encore Players of Livermore would be a great place. You can go ahead and donate to us if you like. <laughs> the other one, and thank you for setting me up for this one. <laughs> I think you can talk about that. We left and invited to our next production, which is called Pets and Their Humans by Mike Sockman. And it's a show, I actually had to read this because I didn't know it. It's a, it's a, a, in the show, when Brad's wife dies, he finds solace by talking to his pets. But what happens when his pets start talking back? <laughs> is Brad going crazy or is he, can he actually talk to animals? It's a quirky, poignant uh, comedy that will encourage audiences to rethink the role of pets in their lives. So our, our presentation of pets will be on the second and third weekends in August at the Bothwell Arts Center on 8th Avenue. And you can start getting tickets for it on, in June on, I believe it's on the Bankhead's website. And you can also find us on Facebook. Okay. Facebook. <laughs> well, all that would like to thank, listen, I didn't have to sort of make sure I don't do it wrong. <laughs> In closing, we'd like to thank the Livermore Library, our sponsor, Paul uh, Sabia, and you, our most marvelous audience. Thank you very much.